We are in the section of future of mobility and I have opened this section with driverless cars. Driverless cars that are actually from uh, many points of view, maybe the future of mankind. Right now on the stage is coming man who is the professor of engineering and data science at Columbia University in New York. He's one of the pioneers of open source 3D printing as well as electronics 3D printing, bioprinting and food printing. He's a man who has quite revolutionary points of view on robotics, especially concerning self-replicating and self-aware robots. He's also the man who wrote a book called Driverless, driverless, intelligent cars, and the road ahead. What kind of road is that? That's the question for Hot Lipson. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. In March 2007, you opened your TED Talk with this question. Where are the robots? What's your answer today, 11 years later? It's a driverless car. It's probably going to be the first robot that most of us will interact with. It doesn't look like a robot. It's not what we expected a robot to look like. But it's probably going to be the first robot most of us will interact with on a daily basis and trust our lives to. So they will finally arrive. Finally, they're here. Are you excited or scared? Both. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very exciting time, but uh, there are a lot of opportunities, but also things to think about. A big disruption coming. Give us the ideas, please. So when you think about uh, the automotive industry, it doesn't necessarily uh, inspire an uh, exponential trend. We have, uh, we have cars, we've had cars for about 100 years. They haven't changed very much. They've always had four wheels, a gasoline engine, a steering wheel, and a driver. Over the years, cars have uh, inspired us in lots of different ways. They've become a symbol of status in many uh, places. Cars have become a symbol of freedom to many people in lots of different ways. But uh, back uh, almost 100 years ago, even 100 years ago, people started thinking about driverless cars. In fact, in a, a, a young company, General Motors, 100 years ago, sort of the Apple and the Google of the 1930s, uh, created a, uh, a big meeting to talk about the future, very much like this meeting here today. There were lots and lots of people gathered to see what the future is going to be going to look like. And uh, one of the big demonstrations they had there in the Futurama in New York in 1939 was this big uh, event where they look at what cities are going to look like uh, maybe 20, 30 years into the future. So they had this big place where you, people were sort of uh, sitting on seats uh, around a, a, big, uh, uh, a big sort of mock city, and they looked down and they saw skyscrapers and factories and lots of different things. And one of the things that everybody saw there were driverless cars. 1939, the automotive industry is just picking up. It's the biggest, the newest thing. And you see driverless cars uh, in the center there. Everybody understood that the future is based on driverless cars. But then other things happened. World War II happened. Other things, and all these dreams had to be delayed. But soon after, people resumed and started thinking about how they actually make these driverless cars. Back in 1956, GM put up another sort of exhibit talking about the way to implement driverless cars to bury a wire in the ground and have the car sort of follow this wire and drive itself around. There are lots of movies and demonstrations of how something like that might actually uh, work. But that was just a fantasy. But again, 20 years, it, it took another 20 years before people actually started implementing this technology. It turned out that it was a little bit more difficult uh, to actually make that happen than people thought, but new, new technologies like transistors and analog electronics allowed that to actually happen. People started building these vehicles that could actually follow a buried wire in the road and drive autonomously. This is a 1970s example of a vehicle in the UK that is actually driving pretty nicely uh, along a, uh, a road. And when I saw this movie in the beginning, I thought, wow, there's no steering wheel. It's amazing. But this is, of course, in the UK, so the steering wheel is on the other side. And you can see here that the car is actually, but it is driving itself with these two sensors in the front that can sense the electromagnetic field coming from the wire buried in the street. So it seemed like finally we're going to have driverless cars. So finally that dream is going to happen. 
But then other things happened that also took our eyes off of this, uh, of this dream. Suddenly, car safety became an issue. People worried about the safety of cars. Miles per gallon or, or, miles, uh, per gallon or kilometers uh, per liter, all these different gas uh, efficiencies suddenly became an issue. And people started worrying about other things rather than autonomous of, autonomy of vehicles. There was another issue, however, that really spelt an end to this dream of driverless cars, and that is the infrastructure cost. While people realized that you can bury a wire in the road and a car could follow it, the mere cost of burying wires along miles and miles, hundreds and thousands of miles of road was prohibitive. The investing in, in putting that wire in there, maintaining it and operating it did not scale. But something else happened. Back in the 50s where cars were pretty advanced and beautiful, a new technology uh, came along. And back in the 50s, it was nowhere in comparison to that uh, automotive technology. And that was the autonomous robotics technology. That was a very nascent kind of uh, technology. It just started. Uh, autonomous robots back in the 50s didn't look very promising at all. But like anything else that follows Moore's law and software, autonomous robots took off at an exponential rate. And this is the product that we're seeing today. So if you look at uh, driverless cars today and you're wondering why are they happening now, you have to realize that a driverless car in its, at its core is no different than a conventional car. The only difference in a driverless car compared to a conventional car is really the control, the software, the sensors that drive the car. The, the chassis, the mechanics are all the same. So when you look at control of a vehicle, the low-level control that keeps the car going straight and making it turn, that was developed decades ago. and We've already had that for a long time. The high-level control of a car has also been developed decades ago. The ability to plan the path or find the shortest path from A to B with traffic and without traffic, we were able to do that decades ago. The one thing that nobody knew how to do is how to control is the mid-level control, the thing that drives the car into the next minute, that merges into traffic, that avoids obstacle, that short-term distance control. That was always the biggest puzzle that prevented autonomous cars from actually hitting the road. So in fact, 1975, people were already building robots that could navigate uh, the open streets, but it turned out it was very, very difficult. And no matter how many software hours and how clever the software and how high resolution the cameras were and how fast the computer were and how slow this machine was, still it kept falling off of the road. It was almost impos impossible to keep it uh, driving. That was 1975. If you fast forward 30 years, the DARPA Grand Challenge of 2004 and 5, still it was virtually impossible to keep a car on the road. I was at Cornell University at the time, and we had a big team that was competing in the DARPA Grand Challenge, uh, and it turned out that no car from over 100 competitors could go more than seven miles on the road. In fact, the average car fell into the ditch within one mile. 30 years from 1975 to 2005, with all of Moore's law and computers being a billion times faster, still nobody could solve this problem of how to keep a car on the road. That has been the biggest puzzle that has kept driver, the dream of driverless cars from actually becoming a reality. Up until five years ago, in fact, no car could tell the difference between a bicycle and a motorcycle, for example, which means you can drive across a desert, but you can't drive across a busy city intersection. In fact, in 2007, DARPA held another big competition, having driverless car uh, compete in an urban environment. And uh, not many people know about this event. This is a, a collision between two driverless cars, maybe the first ever collision between two driverless cars in human history. And when you look at these two driverless cars and you look at the log files of what happened, it turned out that these two cars could, say, could see each other, they could sense each other, but each, they were both stopped at an intersection and each car thought the other car was a concrete block. In other words, just a few years ago, up until a few years ago, cars could see, could sense, but did not understand what they were seeing. And this has been the big challenge of AI. 
The challenge was so large and so dooming that, in fact, the AI community eventually released a huge data set of images and said, okay, obviously we can't solve this problem. Let's see if somebody out there can write software that would understand what is in an image. Have a computer automatically understand what's an image. They released a million images in a thousand different categories, a million images of Superman, and a, th a million, uh, thousand images of sushi, a thousand images of sunflowers, a thousand images in a thousand different categories, a million images in total. They said, here's the image, set, download it, and write somebody, write software that can understand what is in these images. If you can write the software, send it to us, they said, we will run it on a new set of images and we'll see who does the best will create this hall of fame. Now humans can classify these images with 95% accuracy. In other words, image, humans get these images uh, correct 19 out of 20. So how well did computers do five years ago? So the competition was held back in 2010 and the best software could classify images only 75% of the time. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be sleeping in the back of a driverless car that gets it right 75% of the time. That's not good enough. In fact, 75% of the time is good enough for winning the world championship in chess. 75% is good enough for winning the stock market. But 75% is not good enough for driving a car. And this has been one of the challenges of AI, that we humans un underestimate what it means to be intelligent. We think that playing chess is an intelligent thing, but actually being able to tell the difference between a cat or a dog and between a motorcycle and a, uh, and a bicycle is much more difficult than playing chess. It's just we humans are so good at it, we don't understand how difficult that is. 2011 comes along, the competition is held again, and still the best software can get, gets it right 75% of the time. So even with Moore's law moving forward and accelerating, still we cannot solve this problem. The needle isn't moving. I remember teaching in AI classes that the perception problem is so hard. There's something magical about how humans can understand what's around them and that it will take computers decades before they're able to actually understand the, the world around them. 2012 comes along and it is still 75%, 25% error. September 30 comes along, September 30, 2012. And remember that date because it's going to be an Independence Day of some future robotic species. September 30, midnight comes along and a new software comes in that brings down the error to 16%, almost drops it by half. It might not sound a lot to you, 25%, 16%, but for the AI community, that was a watershed moment. I remember my students bursting into my office telling me that somebody brought down the error on this cognition problem almost by half. This was from a group at Toronto uh, University, and uh, they also released a software open source. It was called Supervision, then AlexNet, now Deep Learning. That software was copied. The next year, everybody copied it and improved it, brought down the error to 10%. Humans, remember, are at 5%, so we're still safe. The next year went down to almost 5%. 2015, it went down to 3.5%. 2016, to 2.9%. 2017, the competition is no longer held. It's too easy for computers. Now, behind the scenes, it's a technology that was invented back in 1957, neural networks with a digital camera. Except that the digital camera in 1957 had 400 pixels, 20 by 20, and only eight neurons in one layer. But today's neural networks have 4K pixels and hundreds of layers and millions of neurons. And all of that combined allows machines to understand for the final, for the first time, what is around them. A computer can look at an image like this and in a nanosecond tell you there's a dog, there's a person, there's a chair and another chair. And remember, this is just the beginning because this image was produced for human consumptions. It has red, green, and blue pixels, but a computer can see not uh, in, in a broad range of the spectrum. It can see in radar and x-ray. It can see in the dark. It can see not with two eyes, but with 20 eyes. So this is just the beginning of how computers can see the world. 
So when you look at driverless cars, you might be wondering, why is everybody talking about driverless cars today? Five years ago, nobody talked about driverless cars. What has happened? What has really changed? After all, we were able to drive, control a car from a computer decades ago. We could calculate the path from A to B decade ago. So what has happened in the last few years that is creating this, this resurgence of driverless cars? It is one piece of the puzzle, and that is the ability of AI to understand what's in front of it. Up until just a few years ago, cars could not tell the difference between a puddle and a pothole, or between a child and a fire hydrant. <laughs> Both of these look the same on a radar, but we drive very differently next to a fire hydrant on the side of the road than we do next to a toddler on the side of the road. And until a few years ago, just a few small few years ago, cars could not tell the difference between these two things. So now, cars can understand what's around them. Not just tell the difference between cats and dogs and bicycles and, uh, and fire hydrants and kids, but between anything that you give them data for. They can be trained to understand the difference between a truck and an SUV, not because somebody clever writes some special software, just because they're shown some examples. It's a very easy thing for AI to do. Now remember, all of this software is open source. And lots of different companies are pushing it, and Google is pushing it, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Tencent, Baidu, giving the software for free, even the computing power for free. But what is not free, and this is really important to remember, the data to train the system. The data to train the system is not free, and this is why certain companies have a, a, a bigger lead on, on um, being able to make this technology work because they can train these systems. This AI gets better the more it experiences. So the last thing that's driving uh, driverless cars and is driving its, accelera its acceleration is the cloud. And what I mean by the cloud is this idea that cars learn from each other. One step is whereas a human driver can have only one lifetime of experience of driving, a driverless car can learn from all other cars. If one car experiences something, it can share that experience with all other cars. So in a strange and unfamiliar way, the more cars, the more driverless cars there are on the road, the better each one of them gets. This is very different than the way we humans learn. We don't become better drivers because there are more drivers on the road. In fact, we become a little bit worse. So that thing is, again, a self-accelerating, better cars, more cars on the road, more data, even better cars, and so on. So this is why this is acceleration, accelerating. So let's talk a little bit about the implications of this technology. And the implications are both positive and negative. There's lots of things that everybody can, can appreciate, but some myths that are, are, are uh, circulating. So I want to talk a little bit about some of these implications and some of the things that might surprise you. So one thing that especially autom automotive uh, companies like to, to mention is that people like to drive. But the truth is that most people would prefer to be driven by an autonomous vehicle. Yes, we all like to drive in a, in a convertible on an empty road in the Alps, but most of, the, most of driving isn't like that and it's not fun. Most people, especially younger generations, cannot wait for driverless cars. There's also a pervasive myth that somehow driverless cars require infrastructure, that we need to invest in infrastructure and in transponders and V2I and all kinds of things like that. But the truth is that driverless cars do not need any infrastructure other than what humans use. In fact, they need less. Driverless cars just need good road marks, bridges and tunnels and good surface but they don't need even road signs and other things that humans need. So driverless cars, in fact, need less infrastructure investment. And this is one reason why all the calls to put transponders and, and infrastructure and V2V and V2I, all of these are actually detrimental because we've learned from history that anything that requires infrastructure investment does not scale. So we have to keep everything in the car and the car alone. There's also uh, this myth that somehow cars have to be 100% or near 100% safe to be put on the road. And that's not true either. In fact, cars just have to be a little bit better than the average human driver to be worthwhile as a, as a society to be let loose on the road. And the bar is pretty low. 
There are 23,000 people that die from cars every week around the world. 23,000. That's like a nuclear bomb going off once a month, and we don't even pay attention to it. 23,000 people, children and women, and every pedestrians will die next week from cars. And it's at our fingertips to solve that malady. It's more than all gun violence and, and terrorism and war and drugs combined around the world. In fact, I believe that very soon we'll start looking at cars using three sort of uh, metrics. One is, of course, the horsepower. The second is how, what's the efficiency of the car. But the third factor, and that's really the only thing people really care about when it comes to safety, is how, com how does it compare to a human driver? Is it as safe? Is it twice as safe? Is it three and a half times as safe as a human driver? And I think when it reaches about two times as safe as a human driver, people will readily give, uh, sit in a driverless car and go to sleep because we already trust drivers that are average. There's also this pervasive myth that somehow the ethics uh, uh, of driverless cars is going to be a problem, that a car will not be able to decide who to kill uh, in the case of an impending crash. But the truth is that's a non-issue. First, because crashes will, be all, uh, almost, uh, uh, will almost disappear. It's going to be a moot issue. But also, an AI can calculate with very high precision and very rationally and quickly, what are the odds and what are the likelihood of saving people and do a much better job than we humans are. Again, the bar is very low when it comes to human ethics. I can't tell you how many times I've swerved with my car into the opposing lane to save a squirrel with my children in the back. No, we humans are not very good at making these ethical, rational decisions under pressure, and the AI will be much better at it. There's also a pervasive myth that somehow there will be fewer cars on the road. And it's true that there might be fewer cars at any given time, but these cars will be doing a lot more miles because they'll be shuttling back and forth to do all kinds of errands. And overall, there will be many more miles driven per capita in any way you want to measure it. So there'll be actually more cars on the road, but these cars might be of different shapes and sizes. There might be cars that are small, pods that zoom around making small delivery, deliveries, and we've seen lots of examples, so there are different shapes and sizes of cars. So there's a whole new variety and ecosystem of cars. There's a pervasive myth that there's going to be a lot of job loss, and yes, drivers will lose their jobs, and, and perhaps insurance brokers too, but other disciplines will grow. For example, there will be more cars made, more ma car manufacturing, more car maintenance, more road maintenance. A lot of new jobs will be created and the economy will grow because of driverless cars, not shrink. There's a pervasive myth that somehow driverless cars are going to be expensive, maybe too expensive to own and therefore we all have to share. But in fact, driverless cars are going to be a lot cheaper than conventional cars. Where a conventional car in the U.S. is $30,000 on average, some people estimate that an autonomous vehicle will be about $10,000. Why? Because it's mostly electric. There's no, the drivetrain is very simple. There's no dashboard, which is a substantial cost of the car. There's almost nothing in the car. Because there are no accidents, the car could be made lighter. So in fact, another pervasive, uh, I think, myth is that people will not want to own these cars and we all hop on and off of pods. That might be true for some people who live in a big city and like to, for short distance, uh, that can use these sort of uh, pods that drive people around. But if you have kids, for example, you know that it's very difficult to schlep all kinds of things into a car, in and out, and, and the car seats and toys and things like that. In fact, as we start spending more time in our car doing things other than driving, playing, working, resting, we will want more of our own things in our own car. So I believe that combination of cheaper cars and the fact that we do more things in our car will mean that we will actually want to own our own cars and, and do more things with it that we can't imagine today. Finally, there are a couple of uh, interesting uh, unintended consequences, things that we might want to think about, things that, that uh, experts aren't sure about. For example, one question, one big question is, is this going to be good for the environment or not? Well, cars that hop on the Moore's Law accelerating curve will mean that we're going to throw out cars and upgrade them every two years. Will we be driving more and creating more pollution? 
Will, will there be more or less congestions in big cities? Nobody knows the answer. You can sort of play it both ways. What will happen to people when people can drop themselves off and pick themselves up anywhere? Will we walk less? Will we talk to other people less because we'll all be in our individual pods uh, that going from here to there rather than in public transportation? Nobody knows what's going to happen, what the societal impacts are of these sort of pods. New modes of advertising, as we just heard, are actually a double-edged sword. Imagine that your, your, your watch realizes that you need a shot of caffeine and your car on your way home stops at a place that sells coffee. That sounds like a good idea, but maybe not. Maybe it's a new kind of advertising. Just like we have advertising that pop up on our web, in our web uh, pages every time we, uh, we search the web. Imagine what happens now when you look at uh, some Thai food online and suddenly the car takes you there without you asking. So again, new opportunities for advertising, but maybe something we have to be aware of. And finally, I'm a little bit worried about the opportunities for censorship. We know that the, the internet is very good at censoring information either by on purpose or indirectly, where we hear ourselves in the echo chamber, we only see things we want to see, we only hear things we want to hear, people can control content that we get. What happens when our car is also like that? We can only go certain places. We never get to see certain parts of the city because the software doesn't take us there. What happens when that opportunity uh, emerges? Uh, again, opportunity, but something uh, to think about. So I hope I'm convincing you that people have been thinking about driverless cars for almost a century, from the very early days of the automotive industry. People have been dreaming of this day where there will be driverless cars around the city. For most of the last 80 years, we've been in this disappointment phase where we've been trying to build them, but they were too, too expensive and unreliable. Well, we are at the point now where this is about to flip and everything will change forever. Thank you. Why do you believe that concerning safety, people will compare the driverless car with an average driver and not the best driver or even the better than the best driver? Because I'm the best driver, so I'm comparing the safety not to the average, but to me, because I didn't cause any accident. I didn't make a mistake. And this car could make an accident with probability of 3%. Why do you think people will, would compare to the average? I think, I think people will not buy a car that drives like an average person, but when it, because most people think, like you, they drive uh, above average. That's, yeah, exactly. That's, uh, that's, that's the common... That's right. Yeah. But, but most people uh, don't believe they drive 10 times better than average. That takes a lot of arrogance. Uh, when you go to 20 times better than the average human driver, that's really difficult. So when cars get to the point where they're 10 or 20 times better than the average driver, I think uh, you'd have to be... Uh, you know, pretty to, to put your kids in the back uh, and insist on driving them. That's a, that uh, that takes some. Uh, Where uh, human uh, humans are arrogant sometimes. Yes, arrogance is part of our human nature as right, well. Right, right, right. But uh, but uh, when you put your kids in the back, uh, I think you have to think twice about that. This will be the thing that will persuade. I think so. I think so. The second thing I, I meant to ask you: uh, you have mentioned the ethical questions that AI will be better in solving and answering these ethical questions. Who will tell the AI the correct answer? Or will it be AI who will figure it out? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's actually, it's, 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 you know, it's an interesting academic debate. But really, first I want to say that we should not delay driverless cars because of ethical questions. Because right now, 23,000 people die every week while we debate it, right? So it's not a good thing. But in general, I think a, 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 an AI can calculate very precisely what are the odds how many people are going to survive? And again, it's not black and white. It's not who's going to die and who's going to live. It's what, the, what are the, the probabilities of a serious injury. And AI can calculate that more precisely than a human. And this calculation is very simple. Do the least harm. 
I think I don't I don't think it's it's difficult at all to code this. Uh, and, and if uh, I take the black white scenario, what if you are not the one to be blamed? You know you know the scenarios. I'm I'm absolutely certain of that. There is one person who is walking the street and there are five people who are standing just next to it. Yeah, you know that that is not going to happen. The the reality is that it's, it's more complex. There are probabilities on all you want the AI to do is save the most people. That's all. I think it's actually a very simple calculation. The AI will be very good at it. Uh, it's a wonderful academic debate, but it's not reality. And is it also this answer, an ethical answer, when you are saving somebody who made the mistake, for example, and ran somewhere where he or she was not supposed to be, yeah. And you will harm or even kill someone who was behaving in a correct way, but the AI said, okay, I will cause less damage. Is this, this is a rational answer. Is this an ethical answer as well? Yeah, I, th I, think, uh, I think that overall it averages out because we all make mistakes. Uh, and uh, on average, I want the AI to just save the most people and uh, save punishments and things like that for, for humans. Miroslav Svoboda is asking, can cars recognize their mistakes and learn from them by themselves, or there is still must be someone who will tell them this was wrong and this is right? Absolutely, cars learn from themselves. This is, this is the power of having more and more driverless cars. The more they are out there, the more they learn. Oh, I should have detected that earlier. That thing was indicative of an impending uh, accident, or that thing that I saw there was indicative of somebody moving into the road. All these... All this data feeds in and, and allows cars to learn again, not individually, but as a whole. And that's a very powerful thing. You showed us the picture of the very first uh, car accident concerning the driverless cars. Who was the one to blame in final, in final standing? It was the MIT crash, the, the uh, car that crashed. The red into, one in into, the left side. Into the Cornell car, yes. Was there a penalty there? No, it was. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, we will see what, what the future will be. Ladies and gentlemen, Hard Lipson. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.